Hey everyone, welcome to Just Mental Health with Steph and M, the podcast where we discuss mental health issues from a social justice lens. I'm Emily. And I'm Stephanie. A quick disclaimer before we get started. We are mental health professionals, but this is not to be taken as professional advice. We are also aware that our privilege may cloud our perspective on some topics, and we not only welcome, but encourage you to message us with criticism and correction. Let's get started. So our business of the week is Grace Couple and Family Therapy. is a therapy practice in Oak Park. They see clients in Florida and Illinois. Um, they do telehealth. Um, they're a social justice driven practice, very inclusive. Their mission is to provide therapy to anyone who needs it. Um, looks like they specialize anxiety, depression, mood disorders, relational trauma, couple communication and couple conflict of communication, LGBTQIA plus affirming, infidelity and dishonesty, alternative lifestyles such as kink and poly affirming, divorcing families, parent child relationships, helping professionals, social justice and feminism, and online therapy. Uh, so they have a lot of a lot of therapists. And looks like they have a, a women's group as well. So definitely. Oh, and they're gracecoupleandfamilytherapy.com to learn more. So definitely check them out if you're interested. And we are lucky enough to have the owner and founder of the practice, Grace Norberg, here with us today. Welcome, Grace. Yes. Thank you. Grace, of course, is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a yoga teacher in training. Um, she's the founder of the therapy practice, Grace Couple and Family Therapy that we just talked about. Her mission with the practice is to provide relationship-centered, evidence-based, inclusive therapy to everyone that wants it. And you can find her on Instagram at Words of Grace CFT, um, her website, which was mentioned earlier, and her Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash grace cft and all of those links will be in the bio of this episode and also um, on our instagram so thank you so much for being here today grace thank you both for having me so today we were going to talk about because you are um, a therapist and a yoga teacher in training you incorporate yoga into your practice working with um, clients. Could you tell us just a little bit about how you got started using yoga in your practice? Yeah, so it actually all started when I was 12 years old. My mom took me to my first yoga class. Um, my mom's a nurse and she was working at a hospital that was offering wellness for their employees. And one of those things was a free weekly yoga class, um, just in this like room, like back room in like a hospital building. Um, and so I started going with my mom every week when I was 12 and our yoga instructor, I still remember her name was Yanni and she was absolutely amazing she would actually give us foot massages at the end of each yoga class, which I've never experienced again. And I wish that I could because it was just amazing. And you just see that like she was a really enlightened person and like she was very into service and I just admired her so much. So I think that's where I first started thinking like, oh, wow, you know, yoga is really for me. And maybe this is something that I would do in the future. Um, so that's where it started. And then um, I've just been practicing yoga for a long time, um, going to different classes here and there, sometimes just practicing on my own. Um, and then during the pandemic, I saw that yoga trainings had gone online. And I just, as a busy person, you know, uh, a practice owner, a therapist, I, I hadn't really thought I would have the time to do a training because a lot of times they're all weekend, um, you know, they're, they're 200 hours. So I mean, it's like a lot of time. So um, my vinyasa practice offered this online training and it's accredited with um, the body that gives people their like registered yoga teacher designation. Um, 
So I decided to do it. And I have been doing it on my own pace, just uh, watching the videos that they have online, reading the books that they have assigned. And um, I decided that, you know, it's uh, never too early to start teaching and teaching is part of the training itself as well. So I've been offering some free uh, yoga classes, just an hour of um, me teaching either vinyasa or restorative yoga. And pretty much my friends just come to it. <laughs> and that's how I've been figuring out what my style is as a teacher. And then I've also been doing some restorative yoga in my therapy sessions with clients that have um, expressed interest in that. And also a thing I've been doing previously, but I'm doing more now is doing meditation and breath work in therapy, which has been really helpful, not for, not just for the clients, but for me too, because I get to breathe too when, when they're breathing, which is nice. <laughs> Yeah, that's, um, that's really awesome that you have found something that you love and are passionate about, um, but that also works to be able to incorporate all of that to help people. And yeah, the getting to breathe with the clients. And sometimes we don't always pay attention to that. We're telling our clients to be mindful of their bodies and their breath and what they're doing. And but we're sitting there listening to trauma all day and we're not paying attention to how, what our own body is doing. Um, so that's, that's wonderful that you get to sort of get the benefits of that as well. And the foot massage yeah. at the end of a yoga class sounds really awesome too. <laughs> yes, it was great. <laughs> okay, cool. So, um, so you have a really cool backstory as to what kind of got you in interested in yoga so how exactly how exactly do you like how exactly do you incorporate it into your practice I guess is my question like do you do you bring it up to them like as something you offer something they ask about do you actually do the yoga in the session like mm -hmm. yeah it's it's just in everything so um it I feel that yoga really relates to my training as an integrative systemic therapist. Um, so psychoeducation about yoga is a huge thing that I do during therapy sessions. Um, then I also have done yoga with clients in sessions. So either vinyasa for clients that maybe have depression and they need to move their bodies a little bit. Um, maybe they're in freeze or like um, kind of a a lower mood and and that's something that's helpful to have that movement um and then restorative is the one that I mostly use in sessions so restorative yoga is doing passive stretching poses so holding one very like um just light pose like you're not going to be standing up in warrior two or whatever you're going to be more laying down or sitting down um and holding that pose for five or ten minutes and uh, during the restorative yoga poses, I will have clients to continue to breathe and do breathing exercises that maybe we've practiced before that, and also incorporate mantras that they have either come up with during the therapy session or that I will give to them as something to solidify the therapy session. So based on something that we talked about that day. Awesome. So do you typically do it like towards the end of the session or do you kind of put it, you know, do you, do you start off like, okay, they come in and you get them ready to do the yoga poses or how, how do you frame yeah. your session um, organization? Yeah, I always talk to the client to, like a session before I'm actually going to do any yoga with them and just let them know that I am in training to become a yoga teacher and that I'm offering yoga as part of my therapy sessions and asking them, you know, what their experiences with yoga, what their comfort level is, and then preparing them for the next session where they will either do vinyasa or restorative yoga and just letting them know what to wear kind of, you know, like wearing something you, that you can stretch in or something comfortable 
or to have props available. So for restorative, there's a lot of props involved, like pillows or I just, I try to use poses that are pretty simple. Like I don't want people to have to have all these like complicated items, like a strap and a block and whatever. It's just like, get a pillow from your couch or from your bed and, and we'll use that. There are some poses that can use a chair or a wall as well. And, and that's pretty easy as well because mostly people are sitting in a chair in a room with a wall. I think that's really great that you incorporate it because I, I'll i mention it to my clients. Like if we're talking about coping strategies or relaxation and stuff like that, I'll be like, you know, you could do this, you could do this, you can try yoga. And then they're just like, okay, cool, thanks. And, you know, I don't really, um, you know, like I did yoga, like I took a yoga class in college, like for credit. And then I used to go to yoga at my gym, but that's it. Like, I don't know a ton about it. Um, So I think that's really, that sounds really beneficial to actually do it with them in the session um, and, and really connect it to their treatment um because I think sometimes it's used as like they might people might think of it as like a distraction or just something to relax but not necessarily something to heal um so I think that's really that's really cool that you use it as you use it as a as a tool as a therapy intervention it's a really unique yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and and I used to do the same thing as you just sort of assign yoga as maybe like a an activity or a homework or I would suggest it to clients and tell them about how it could help them but actually doing it in a therapy session I think it is really helpful because yeah you know the client may not be familiar with yoga and they don't really take it in or like believe the benefits that it can have but then when they experience it in the therapy session with their therapist that they already trust and that you know you've already talked about or worked through a lot of things with it shows them like oh this actually really does change how I feel and and I think it's motivating too like um the clients that I do vinyasa with they maybe want to do yoga outside of a session, but they feel maybe disempowered to do it. They don't know like what sources to to search for. Um, Maybe they don't feel comfortable going to a class with other people um, and doing it in the session. It's like motivating, like, oh, I can, I can do this. It's completely tailored just to me. And, um, you know, I, I feel like maybe this is something that I can do on my own a little bit now for five minutes and I can do the pose that Grace showed me, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I am interested with, you know, um, the pandemic and 2020 and how everything was sort of locked down and social distancing. A lot of the majority of practices went to telehealth. How did that um, change how you used this as an intervention or did it? Yeah, I started doing this during telehealth. So I think it'll be weird doing it in person, actually. Um, my office is really small, so I don't know how I will do it in person with people. We might have to find an alternative space like the the waiting area because my office that I'm in right now is my home office um it's in the basement of my house and there is a large waiting area a desk room and then a therapy room so we'll probably have to get creative um I actually it's so funny how serendipitous things are um I just put an offer and and got accepted to buy an office space for my practice and it's a yoga studio (laughs) that I'm going to be turning into a therapy office it'll be the actual studio will be built out into five different therapy offices and I do hope to make the offices big enough to be able to facilitate if you know I wanted to do yoga in the office with clients. 
That's awesome. Congratulations. That's going to be really cool. And it sounds like the perfect space for what you want to do. So that'll be exciting when that happens. That is, Thanks. that is really awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's so, so this was kind of your, uh, like a, like your big project for your quarantine was like kind of delving into this new, uh, this new tool, like tool therapy tool, but also like, so you're, are you also wanting to be a teacher aside from your therapy, like be it, or are you just looking to integrate? Yeah, I don't want to be a yoga instructor. Um, I already have enough jobs, so <laughs> gotcha. I'll just, I'll just be using it as a therapist, um, mm -hmm. probably. It has been fun offering the classes to my friends and just doing it for free. And, and maybe I'll continue that if, if my friends continue to want to show up for that. Um, but other than that, I, and I may do like a yoga therapy group, for example. Um, I actually have a clinician, Cicely Green, who did a yoga therapy group for trauma and did restorative yoga in her group therapy sessions. And then they followed the restorative yoga with talking and processing about their traumas and what came up during the yoga sequence, um, which was I mean, people loved it. It was really, really successful. A lot of healing happened in that group. Um, and I may do something similar to that in the future. That's so cool. I'm like really interested in, in this. Like that's, it's so, it's very unique, you know, and you hear like, oh, I'm going to therapy. You don't, you don't pick, you picture yourself sitting. Well, most people picture themselves like laying down, you know, with like the therapist has like the, how do you feel about yeah. that? That's kind of like the <laughs> stereotypical, but like even people who are experienced in therapy, they just imagine themselves like sitting on the couch and talking. Um, so that's, that's really cool to use this extra tool and the body. I mean, there is, I feel like there is um, like a, more of a movement to include body stuff, um, like somatic kind of therapy kind of stuff, um, mm -hmm. body sensations and stuff. But I, I think that the actual like moving your body, um, moving your body with a purpose is, is definitely really new concept. Um, so I think that's really cool that you're incorporating this. I'm, curious so how do you kind of connect it like you said you tailor it to the client so how how do you go about doing that like how do you connect it with what they're working on in therapy mm -hmm. yeah so for example a client might tell me um I have a really hard time setting boundaries in my life um I feel like I'm codependent with my family. Um, and, you know, they may give an example like today, like my dad asked me to do this and I just said yes, even though I didn't feel like I energetically was like available for that. And so then when we get to the end of the session and we've talked about, okay, we're gonna do 10 or 15 minutes of restorative yoga at the end of the session, then I'll, I'll sometimes say to the client, like, do you want to create a mantra based on your boundaries or your intention to create boundaries. Um, or I'll just give them a mantra and I'll say like, are you okay with this mantra of um, I am worthy of space, something like that, or I'm worthy of taking up space. And then when we go into the first restorative pose, I'll have them breathe in, I am, and exhale, worthy of taking up space. And that will be a meditation that they'll do while in the restorative pose. And then if we have time to, do, to change poses and do like two poses, then I'll create another mantra. Um, like I might say, I imagine safety and security. Um, so then they're, they're sort of imagining this container of like, I can be safe and secure within myself, not, not necessarily having to get that from saying yes to everybody else. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. So, so like, it's like one mantra sort of per pose to kind of really give you that time to 
meditate and sit with that particular thought and Mm -hmm. that's exactly that's awesome so when you you talked a little bit about you know like um using it for clients with depression and then using it for clients with trauma um I know that like Emily was saying sort of the the push now the movement now in trauma work and being trauma-informed is understanding how the body remembers trauma and holds on to trauma and how kind of healing the body and the mind at the same time is is better and most trauma is focused on most trauma work is focused on a lot of cognitive stuff and not everybody it just doesn't work for everybody so incorporating the two physical and, and cognitive can be really helpful so can you kind of talk about what that's like when you're working with clients with trauma help how is the yoga helpful to them how are, how is the poses helpful and how do you integrate that into the work mm-hmm. yeah definitely um so i like to psychoeducate clients about the nervous system and what happens when your nervous system is in fight or flight uh, or freeze and capitulate and how to get the nervous system back into the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest, whereas um, sympathetic activation would be the fight, flight, freeze, or capitulate. Um, And I explained to them how yoga can help them practice that, practice coming back from that um, activation. So for example, diaphragmatic breathing is shown to help people calm the vagus nerve, which is activated when you're in fight or flight. Um, And diaphragmatic breathing being, picturing breathing into the belly. So like the belly becoming a balloon and and expanding when you're breathing in and then um, contracting when you're breathing out. And so a lot of times I'll practice just a breathing exercise with clients. Um, Like if they're starting to become activated and I can see that that's happening in the session saying like, okay, how about we pause and just take some deep belly breaths and and do that for a couple of minutes. And, And that's something that I'll also ask them to do while in the restorative poses is focus on diaphragmatic breathing. Um, Another thing that can be really helpful is um, basically developing heart rate variability. Um, That's been shown to really help people with trauma to regulate themselves. So um, one main way of helping with that is box breathing. Uh, So so basically controlling the in and out breaths. So breathing in for four, holding the breath for four, exhaling for four, and holding the out breath for four. Um, And then another one can be exhaling for a longer time than you inhale. Um, This also calms the vagus nerves. So just counting your inhale and then counting your exhale twice as long as the inhale. Yeah, I I love using those too. Um, of course, I don't use them with restorative poses, but you know that's sort of like a, a a mindfulness calming relaxation intervention, um, and it's it's pretty amazing if you can get the client to buy into it first. Like sometimes they're like, "What is breathing gonna do?" I, I breathe all the time. And I'm like, well, yeah, but you're breathing wrong. So I'm, I'm going to teach you how to do it you're right. You're breathing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're all breathing wrong most of the time. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. so, you know, we have to practice it. And it's really this amazing hack that your body has. You can override your system with your breath. Your breath gives the cue for everything. So, um, it, it, when you can get that buy-in and you can get them to use it and then they're surprised at how well it works. And you're like, yeah, literally that's all you had to do was breathe. I know it, it sounds too easy, but um, it just kind of, I don't know. I think it just kind of shows how we don't, nobody teaches you that. A, a lot of schools and preschools are starting to do more of that, which I think is great. But like, for us, our generation and, and older, like nobody taught us how to do that. Nobody taught us to take a moment and to breathe. And um, 
so it seems very foreign when you try to practice it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then with restorative yoga, like an added benefit. So not only are you maybe breathing um, in a more calm way or, you know, doing diaphragm breathing, um, trying some box breathing in there, it also just laying in a restorative pose, it creates passive stretching of the body, um, which can really help with um, opening, circulation, relaxation, healing, um, and it can heal from adrenal fatigue as well. So like we're constantly in our society feeling anxious, like there's so many things to do, there's overstimulation, um, there's, there's all this trauma just like in the air, especially now, and taking that time to just lay in a restorative pose can really help you rest and digest instead of being in that fight or flight. Are there any, um, that you're in any restorative poses you're able to describe right now? that our listeners yeah. can maybe benefit from? Yes, definitely. So I have a really easy one that anyone can do, like maybe they're at their desk or you're in your chair that you're using for therapy. Um, and it's just called a chair forward fold. And so you'll just be sitting in your chair with your feet on the floor and then just folding straight forward over your legs and allowing your arms to hang and uh, touch the ground. And you can stay there for about five minutes. Um, I wouldn't recommend staying there for like too long because the blood does go to your head. It, it's considered an inversion pose. Uh, so come up slowly from that one. <laughs> Don't just sit up and, you know, potentially pass out in your chair. <laughs> Um, then another super easy one is called legs up the wall. So basically you just I lay on the ground. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, you just lay on the ground next to a wall and put your legs up it and just rest them there. Uh, for some people, if you have tight hamstrings, you can bend the knees and actually just put the feet on the wall and still get the benefits of that because that one um, reverses circulation. So your circulation usually goes um, from your head down to your feet, but when you put your feet above your head, it kind of reverses that and can have a really nice effect. Sweet, I'm gonna try those like yeah, maybe as soon as we're done with this because Lord knows I need it right now. Um, but also like, I loved doing yoga. I did yoga in college too. Um, I did it mostly, well, I got introduced to it because I was a theater minor and we had to learn about movement, which I think was really helpful. Um, it was helpful for theater, but it was really helpful personally because there was kind of a little bit of that of like paying attention to your body. How does your body move? What does it feel like? And like doing certain poses and sort of like, where's the emotion? Where's the energy in your body? You know, and then they, they even had us do some visualization stuff, which of like um, put a color to it, you know, put a shape to it, which is like a part of the technique you could do in, in EMDR too. And it was just interesting how that was being taught before I even knew what any of that was. But um then, of course, you know, there, it was, I mean, most of the yoga classes that I went to after that were typically all white people ran by a white person. Um, and I just always looked at it as a form of exercise and not, you know, but now realizing that it's a spiritual practice for people, um, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that and how it's just sort of how, how we've kind of um, whitewashed it and kind of the cultural appropriation of yoga in American culture. Yeah, definitely. Even I feel like I lost the true meaning of yoga at some point in my life. Um, when I first started, it really was about self-care. I, I felt that's how I 
you know, started internalizing it, but then just, I, I kind of forgot about Yanni and got into like that sort of, you know, core power, like corporate type of yoga, where it's all about like, who can do a headstand and, you know, who's the most fit. And like, I, I would even find myself when the instructor would be like, and you know, you can always go into child's pose. I'd be like, hell no, I'm not going into child's pose. Like I'm, I'm going to like, be the best at this um I am very competitive unfortunately so I I I feel like that was toxic like it really is not what yoga really is um it yoga is not a fitness practice yoga is a spiritual practice exactly as you said um and I think that it's it's really just like <laughs> I think how western society and like capitalism decided that they could make money off of yoga because the way capitalism often works is that you tell someone what's wrong with them and then how you can find you know give them the solution for a, a small price you know um so I just yeah I I actually wrote down um like a, a definition of yoga that, that I got um, from my training and I wanted to share it with you all. So the purpose of yoga is to unite with pure awareness and realize our true natures as the embodiment of divinity, which liberates us. So we, we all through yoga can realize that we are a divine spirit that just inhabits our mind and body. So so when we think about that as the true meaning of yoga is what yoga is supposed to be practiced as, I feel like it's, it's so liberating like that. You don't have to pay anyone for that. Like you, I mean, I support yoga instructors and everything, but like you can literally be a yogi if you are just sitting in, you know, a pose in your house and breathing and meditating that's what a yogi is you don't yes, have to earn it yogi. by doing dancer pose <laughs> yeah that's so interesting um I I saw a video a few years ago of a man dressed up like Gandhi and then there were these white women in a yoga class and they were just like you know just talking like Oh, I'm, uh, I did such a good job. I did all the poses perfectly. And then he's like, that's not what this is about. And then, and then he's like, is this cold play? Like they were playing cold play in the yoga class. Um, and it was supposed to be funny, but like, it really was showing a true, like a true problem, honestly, like just how, how yoga has just been so, um, another another uh, thing that's coming up. So I did a, um, I did a study abroad trip in India um, for six weeks and we went to a yoga uh, center of some sort. Um, and I, and I remember thinking, and that was like right after I did my yoga class in college. And I remember thinking, this is so different. <laughs> like this is nothing like what they actually taught us in class and this is actually what yoga is supposed to be um so the difference there was was definitely interesting when you say that you know it's very liberating to sort of take that um competitive fitness part out of yoga um it, it really is because just you saying that made me feel better about doing it like um I, I love doing yoga for the fitness benefits, but also for the mental health benefits. And it just feels good. Um, but, you know, sometimes depending on the class and where you're at, it may not always feel like um, the most accepting space. And so some of that could be, you know, based on, you know, your race or your ethnicity, but a lot of it could also be based on body size. Um you know, there is a, I don't know, I guess I, I had one experience in yoga. Emily, you were there. Um, when we went to that hot yoga thing, we tried it and it was awful. <laughs> it was awful. I got sick. It was so hot. I had to leave. I was getting sick and I was like, I can't do this. But the instructor, 
I, I wasn't making it up because yeah, I, I remember right there. I was like doing all the, and I've been doing yoga for like beginner yoga for a few years, but it was a beginner class. So I was able to do it. And she kept calling me out by name and saying like, if you need to adjust or you're doing great, you're doing great. And I'm like, well, how am I doing great? What about that girl over there? What about her right next to me? Like, why are you, I don't know. It was kind of weird and it made me feel really uncomfortable. Like, um, okay, like one or two, you're doing great is, is nice. Thank you. And then after that, like, please just leave me alone and let me do the stretches. I don't know if that has anything to do with what we're talking about, but it can be kind of an intimidating space um, for people that want to try yoga to go to a yoga class and it's expensive typically. So there, there's a, a sort of an access and a class um, element to it. If you can't afford it, or if there's no yoga classes where you are, you have to, you know, find another alternative or, or try it at home by yourself, but. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like maybe that person was just trying to get you to come back to that yoga class, like trying to spell it. <laughs> Oh. Um, I don't know if you guys know Glennon Doyle or have read um, Glennon Doyle's new book, um, Untamed. It's really good. It's, it's a feminist Bible for sure. Um, one of the stories that, that Glennon Doyle shares in the book is that she went to a hot yoga class and the instructor said, like, you can't leave this room, basically. Like, and it was a 90 minute hot yoga class. And the instructor was like, don't walk out of this room like if you have to stop you know doing the poses you can lay in child's pose but I'm challenging you not to walk out of this room and Glennon Doyle had never been to a hot yoga class before and was like I'm going to die I literally feel like I'm dying I mean you guys know if you, you the first time you go to hot yoga you feel like you're going to die um, and, but she forced herself to stay in the class and then later kind of looked back and was like, why didn't I just walk out the door? Like the door was unlocked. I could have left, but, but I just forced myself to, to make myself sick, you know, in the competition of staying in a yoga class. It's craziness. That's, that's not self-care. That's mm -hmm. not what yoga is about. There's so much, um, just like self-care is so confused like it's in general like this is a little a bit what we talked about a few weeks ago when we did a um an episode on intuitive eating that like eating healthy doesn't mean like depriving yourself of foods you actually like which is then only going to make you sad like how is this good for you if like you're feeling sad and you're not enjoying your food you know how is yoga good for you if you feel like you're dying in the middle of your class like it should make you feel good um and not to mention that the class itself is probably you know taking a, away from the actual point of yoga um like what you mentioned earlier, that it's not about necessarily about exercise and it's not about competition. And it's not about like pushing through, you know, listening to your body. The point of it is to be helpful, to make you feel, make your body and mind feel good. So. Yeah. And um, you all have probably heard of Bikram yoga. Um, so it's a style of hot yoga that's really regimented and it was developed by this guy named Bikram who ended up turning out to be a sexual predator. Um, and his, that style of yoga, it was, it was very similar. It was like, stay in this class, stay in the room, no matter what. And it was, it was like a physical challenge. Um, he, he did say that his style of yoga could purify the body and that hot yoga is meant to like purify the body, um, which I, I do believe that there are benefits of being in a warm room and doing yoga. Um, you know, it does make you feel more open and flexible for sure. But I think there, there are definitely ways to do it and, and ways that are really not healthy to do it and not fun. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, um, 
cool that you brought that up because I remember seeing the there's a documentary about it and I I watched it and I was like my mind was blown I was like I didn't know any of this was going on I didn't know that there you know because you see Bikram yoga like advertised everywhere and and I was like oh yeah it's hot yoga whatever and then once I realized how toxic of a person he was I was like okay gonna avoid that um but yeah that's that's a really good point. Um, oh man, I, you know, I had a, I had a follow-up question and it just, it just went out <laughs> again. This happens a lot. Um, <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Um, so <laughs> when you are, um, when you're doing this training to become a yoga teacher and stuff, um, is it, trauma-informed yoga training or is it just like general yoga training like is there and is there a difference really yeah the training I'm doing is just a general 200 hour yoga training they do have um, trauma-informed parts of it like I would say I mean I love the training my my vinyasa practice is doing a really good job with it um they in every live session that I've been to where they're instructing about something, they do talk about that. Um, like I went to a training about holding space, uh, which basically is, is what therapists do as well. We hold space for our clients' stories and they talked for, I mean, it was like a 10 hour training and, and it was all about like, how do you make sure to hold space in a healthy way for your clients as a yoga instructor? because not everyone is in the same, you know, place and you do need to be careful about the music you're playing. Like, like you were saying, Emily, I was laughing when you were talking about the cold play, like played in the yoga class because they actually discourage playing any music with words because people can feel triggered by that. Um, then people who don't want to be touched in a yoga class, for example, like that's a huge thing. And luckily, pretty much every yoga class I've been to, permission was asked before touching. Um, but that's a huge thing that, that's very trauma informed is making sure that you're getting people's consent for anything that you're doing in a yoga class. Um, so there, yeah, there are more advanced, um, like specific trauma yoga trainings, but they're not necessarily in just your regular 200 hour. Yeah. Okay. I, I wondered, cause I wondered how many yoga instructors in general were trauma informed. I think the ones that I've been to, um, they were pretty good. I didn't notice anything that I was like, Oh, don't do that. And the asking permission and stuff was pretty consistent with every class, but um, I just wondered, you know, if somebody was seeking out a yoga class, um, you know, what sort of things maybe if they're worried about their trauma and being triggered in that class, what sort of things could they do or how could they advocate for themselves maybe in that space um, to feel more comfortable? Yeah, I would say talking to the instructor prior to the class could be helpful or maybe even calling the studio and talking to whoever was answering the phones that day and checking to see like what kind of training the instructors have, what their policies are, what their beliefs are. And then just knowing that a yoga practice is yours, that you could be in a class and the instructor is telling you to do a pose. And if that pose feels triggering for you in any way, you can choose not to do it. A lot of instructors will say at the beginning of their class, like if you ever need to rest or you don't, don't want to do a pose, go into child pose and, and do your own thing. And no one's going to you know, tell you you can't do that or, or judge you for doing that. So I just think everyone deserves permission to make the practice their own. And I, I've even seen people in a yoga class, like not even following the class at all. Like they're just doing something else. And I'm like, oh yeah, go you, you know, you know what you want to do. <laughs> 
Yeah, this is all um, really good stuff <laughs> that, that needs to be incorporated into all yoga classes. I mean, the trauma-informed stuff, anything to do with the body, like any service or class or anything that has to do with touching um, or anything that could be triggering, there definitely needs to be that trauma-informed component. Um, and also, you know, a, a part of kind of this conversation is that you don't even, you don't even need a class. Like you can literally be sitting at your desk or like laying in bed with your feet on the wall, you know, to, um, to get the benefit, um, which I think, you know, like you mentioned is a, is a misconception of yoga. Like people think like, you know, you have to go to this fancy studio, um, or even like they think you have to set aside like an hour to do a whole yoga practice or something. Um, and you don't, you can, you can get the benefit anywhere, anytime. I mean, maybe not, I mean, yeah, probably not anywhere, anytime, probably not everywhere. It's appropriate to like lean over in your chair, but like, you know, more places and more times than, you know, we generally understand yoga to be. Right. And yeah. at the very least, you can breathe anywhere, anytime, you know, and, and take time for your breath. So that's a good thing to always, when you teach people how they can do that, they have that skill with them always. And it doesn't matter where you are. Nobody is really going to pay attention if you're just taking deeper breaths. You know, it's not, doesn't draw a lot of attention to you, which I think sometimes people are worried about with using their coping skills in public because um, mm -hmm. they don't want people to look at them when they're doing it. But, you know, breathing is, you can do that. Nobody's paying attention and you can calm yourself anywhere, anytime. So. Yes, definitely. And Emily, I, I love that you brought up that yoga doesn't have to be like this whole hour dedicated to it. I, I always tell my clients that because it's just, it's like anything, if you overwhelm yourself with it and you have some like rigid expectation of what it is supposed to be, it takes the fun out of it. You're not going to want to do it. So I, I say, yeah, like do yoga for 10 minutes, like five minutes if, if that's all that you have time for or feel like doing that day you've still given yourself a gift I like that putting it that way like you're giving yourself a gift I was just gonna say the same yeah. thing so that's a wonderful way yeah yeah that is self-care giving yourself a gift mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um as we're wrapping up is there any thoughts or tips or anything that you want to leave the listeners with um, as far as yoga and practicing it in, you know, in the therapy setting um, or anything that they should know that we haven't already gone over? Um, one thing that I wrote down that I really wanted to share. Um, so Monique Melton is an anti-racism educator uh, and she has a quote that says, perfectionism is white supremacy by another name. And that really struck me because I think that the westernization of yoga is, is very perfectionistic. It's like, you need to look a certain way and you need to do poses in a certain way. And that is how white supremacy has like invaded the practice of yoga. And I think, my message for everyone is that like, you are a yogi right now if you want to be and you know any pose that you want to do any you know focus on your breath any meditation like the, those are the three main things of yoga um asana which is the practice and, and posing of yoga pranayama which is breath and dhyana which is meditation then you're practicing yoga and you're a yogi and it, it doesn't have to look or sound or be any certain way. And that's how we break free of white supremacy in yoga. That's so interesting. Perfection is, perfectionism is white supremacy. With an, by another name. By another name. That's good. Yeah, because yoga, like westernized yoga is definitely very, it has a very perfectionistic sort of undertones. Um, that's, that's so interesting. 
thank you so much for coming on and talking with us and sharing your expertise and your insights and your passion with this. I hope um, that the people listening uh, can really maybe now, you know, if you weren't into yoga before, if you were afraid of doing it or, or didn't know, you know, how to start it, now you kind of know that you can just do it and um, do it however it, you know, it feels good for you. Um, and also that it can be used as a way of healing um, with, with mental health. So thank you for sharing that. Do you have any resources that our listeners might be able to use to learn more about this? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, the teacher training that I'm doing is through my vinyasa practice and it's all online and self-led. Um, it's a course on Teachable and I highly recommend it. I think that the training is really good and if you apply yourself then you know you'll be able to do it and, and learn just as much as you could in person um and other than that i encourage everyone to follow alternative types of like yoga instructors on instagram and i can think of a list to share with you guys i off the top of my head i don't know their handles so i don't want to just like say it um but Yes, um, I think that is a really essential part of, of just allowing yourself to broaden your idea of what yoga is. When you see people that are differently abled or have like different body types, um, people of different races that are teaching yoga or doing yoga, then you feel more free to be a yogi yourself. Yeah, well, that would be great. Thank you. Um, we can share that list on Instagram as well so other people can follow them. And of course, they can follow you. Um, and mm -hmm. we had, we gave your Instagram handle and your Facebook. Um, and that will, of course, be on our Instagram. And um, again, will be in the description of this episode for anyone that, that wants to follow Grace and keep up with her. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up. That's our show. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with friends and family. And don't forget to follow the show's Instagram for updates on new episodes at Just Mental Health Podcast. That is with a period between each word. We record a new episode every week. This is Steph. And M. And Grace. Signing off. Thanks for listening. <laughs>